And uh, a guy named Howard E. Anthony was the one who had bought the company out of uh, bankruptcy in 1935. And it was his his vision that came up with the first electronic. Uh, Heath. So here's a, here's a picture of uh, Howard Anthony, one of the, the famous ones. Um, uh, Howard was an engineer and... Uh, in uh, spring of 1947, a lot of military surplus parts were ending up on the market, and uh, he and an engineer friend uh, realized they could buy uh, something like 5,000 oscilloscope tubes for about the equivalent of about 100 bucks in today's dollars because they were being basically disposed of by the government. That's what launched um, the, the electronic era, but Heathkit began with Edward, Edward Bayard Heath. This rather rough and tumble looking fellow who in 1914 started the uh, the Heath Air, uh, Airplane Company uh, and he sold uh, airplane kits, uh, the most famous being the Heath Parasol airplane. And he was a he was a great aviator. The factory picture you see here um, is actually on Territorial Road in uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan. But this is where the Heath Parasol factory actually began. And um, <clears throat> tragically, Edward Heath died in February of 1931 during a test flight of one of his airplanes. And by 1935, uh, the company had gone fully bankrupt and it was purchased by a very young man named Howard E. Anthony. Wow. 1963, we came out with the monobanders. This happens to be an HW-22, the 40 meter version. That's an A model. A models came out in 66. And I don't know why, because the only thing they changed, you go from upper to lower sideband. Well, I don't know if anybody operates upper sideband on 40. Anyhow, this rake here uh, sold for originally $104.95. And full 100 watts output uh, was, and very simple to operate. Not many buttons or switches on the front. It was a great field day uh, rig. And I got to help with the engineer on it because I lived out in the country. So I had a prototype in my car all the time because it, it took me at least a half hour to drive into work across some of the worst roads in the state of Michigan. <laughs> the original prototype I had had a big die cast knob on the, on the front end of it. And so I'm talking to the engineer, and he says, man, you're FMing all over the place. He says, have a hard time tuning in. Better bring that thing in. Well, you see that big gray plastic knob? That was the results of my trial. Because the big <laughs> die-cast knob got thrown away, and that's how we ended up with that knob. Uh, at this time when the rig came out, 40-meter band was 7.2 to 7.3. Well, they've expanded it since then, so this thing will not tune uh, the entire band, but I hooked up that rig here and checked in the bid cars with it. Got good reports on it. Okay, uh, this is the, when I started at Heath in 1960, the big push was to go from AM to sideband. Uh, you'll notice that the Heath line kind of resembles the Collins line. Um, we, that some of the prices in 64. And we had, of course, we followed up with the accessories. Go ahead, Bob. And the big thing at Heath was field day. I mean, you shut down the whole ham engineering for field day. This was 1967. I'm the handsome guy on the bottom row and second from the left. Um, this was a NY4, I appreciate this. This was a joint field day between uh, Hams at Heath and the Blossom Land Amateur Radio Club. Uh, over 25% of the Hams at Heath were, were employed at Heath. 1,500 employees, well, all together during the good years and second shifts and all the stores, we had close to 1,500 employees. I remember talking one time on 20 meters to a German ham in Munich. He worked for Heathkit. He ran a store over there. So this was a long time ago. Um, top row, second guy in, that's Jack Leishman, N8XX. He lives in Hudson, Florida in the winter 
Traverse City, Michigan in the summer. Oh, yeah. So he's going to come down at 1st November, and I'm supposed to meet up with him at the Spark Fest. He loves to go to Spark Fest. Next to him is Jim Linky. He is W8XX. And Jim was a non-Heath ham. He was a representative for a drug company. And I remember that uh, he was quite a DXer. He, would, he was on that rig all the time looking for the rare ones. Some of you nurses remember what a PDR is. That's Physician's Desk Reference. Used to be a real thick book. And Jim every year would give his old PDR, he got a new one every year, to my wife so she could use it in her nurse's training. So she was always grateful to Jim for that. The fellow on the very end, top row, that's Doyle Stralin. This was his kit, amongst others. He also did the HW100 and a lot of other accessories. <laughs> Doyle came from Montana. The radio went bad in Minneapolis. They put it on the train, drop it off at the next stop. Well, they couldn't fix it. They put it back on the train, went down to the next stop. When you got to Libby, Montana, that's that the buck stopped there. Doyle either fixed it or pitched it, so he worked on some real dogs. Also, also he wrote, he uh, drove a Mercedes, one of the old square type diesel uh, Mercedes, four door. It was held together with Bondo duct tape and bailey wire, but that sucker started every day. In the, in the worst Michigan weather, you could count on diesel Doyle's car starting. Next to him is Earl Harris. Go back once. I'm saying next. Oh, there you go. Uh, oh, sorry about that. That's Earl Harris. Uh, Earl lives in Stevensville, where I used to. He, uh, he was in the audio department, got a double E degree from the University of Arkansas, and he... Uh, he left after a while, he was in the audio section, and they hired him back later on to be the chief, uh, the chief, op, uh, chief engineer of the ham department. And the bottom row, the guy in the middle, is Charles Gilmore. Uh, he is the first digital engineer that he hired. He later became uh, uh, chief engineer of the whole engineering department later on. And the guy at the very end, that's Dar Evans, you've already met him. If you were a ham at Heath, you got a free QSO card. You just told your supervisor, he'd turn it in, and they'd give you 100 QSO cards. Uh, this is the later version. The newer one had a picture of the St. Joe Pier. Okay, Bob, next. This is our field day site. It was called Mud Lake. Misnomer, no lake, no mud. <laughs> Mosquitoes, yes. <laughs> it was a big opening. It used to be a Boy Scout facility. So we had this big opening, and then we would camp our tents or whatever underneath the uh, trees. Let's go to the next one, Bob. This is our CW station. That's Tom Jaffe, K8. J.F. Chet volunteered to do all the cooking. Uh, Heath even, uh, through their employees recreation association, kicked in 200 bucks for uh, food and beverage. Company gave us a truck, a six kilowatt uh, electric started on and generator, all the coax cable we needed, connectors, AC lines, ground rods, you name it, we got to take it out there. Heath even sent along a professional photographer because some of the rigs we were using would be brand new. Or he didn't photograph the prototypes, but the stuff that was going to be in the catalog, they sent the uh, professional photographer along. Well, Chet, uh, Chet and his boys, you had two teenage boys, and they set up at field day. We got there about 10 o'clock, start putting up antennas, started at 2 like it normally does. And uh, Chet had uh, a great dinner. He had he had marinated ribs, we had baked potato, baked beans. We had a full thing of it. And the next thing his boys had, they had built this little cart 
on with bicycle wheels, big wide tire bicycle wheels, and they could pull it around to the different tents. And you had a nice chest with uh, beverages and also the coffee pot. The coffee pot we use is one of these, like you would hang over a campfire. And they had all the condiments, so they'd come around the tent. You didn't even have to walk over and get coffee. It was great. Well, about dusk, the first evening, Chet comes around the tent. He says, uh, got a problem. What's that? He says, I forgot my big frying pan. Oh, well, how are you going to make eggs and bacon without a big frying pan? He says, well, I was hoping one of you guys had a frying pan. Ah, wrong guy to ask. So he went around asking everybody if they had a frying pan. Of course he didn't. So his last words were, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, come sunrise, we smell fresh coffee, eggs, bacon, and flapjacks. Oh, wow. So his, his sons come around with the coffee cart. And he says, wow, he says, you found your frying pan. <laughs> no, no, we didn't. Well, I happen to mention this. At the start of field day, one of the members from the club had a brand new Ford F-150 truck. Beautiful thing. First new vehicle they ever owned. And he drove it to field day and carefully parked it underneath the trees. And of course, he used to brag about it a lot. So anyhow, he's in the midtown operator and Chet comes, but the boys come around and say, um, did you find frying pan? He says, no, we found something better. What's that? We found this pickup truck and it's got these big, wide hubcaps on it. <laughs> so we uh, we borrowed a couple. He says, they were great. Just then the flap on the 20 meter tent flies open and this body streaks over to this brand new pickup. And he looks around and we're all outside watching this and he's carefully looking at each wheel everything's in place. Chet comes out and he says, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of good stories on field day, some of them we can't uh, repeat. Okay, Bob, this is the VHF tent, that's Dar Evans and Ray Nelson. That's the SB, uh, six meter SB 110. We used uh, six and two meters. We were so close to Chicago and South Bend and Kalamazoo that we had a lot of VHF activity, which we don't get down here. Next, this was one of the setups in one of the, I think it was the back of a station wagon, can't remember. Anyhow, I forget what band he was, I think he was our 10 meter guy. As a member of the ham radio department, I was transferred in 1966 when they did away with the Marine Department. Uh, the other, we had two engineers in Marine Department and a supervisor and two techs. The two techs got uh, put in different departments. The other engineer went back to Collins Radio and the, the head guy from Ham Radio Department, his last name was Schaefer, by the way. He comes over and grabs me and says, I want you in the Ham Radio Department. Hey, <laughs> how am I to turn down being an engineer in the Ham Radio Department at Heathkill? Anyhow, this was my first project. It was called the GR88 followed by the 98. The 88 was this machine here. It was a tune 170, 174 down to 152. Uh, at that time, in those time of the year, that band was loaded with signals. Public safety, fire departments, uh, uh, sanitation, that was a real popular band back in the 60s. This is before everything changed and now everything is higher frequency and they've got uh, <coughs> different modes they use and also it's all trunking. Scattered thunderstorms. Saturday. This is uh, Noah Weather out of Largo. This radio is probably 50, 50 some years old. Uh, still works. Um, I was often asked how come it didn't cover the two meter band. Well, there was very little activity on the two meter band that was FM. But we checked into it. The tuner in here was not built by us. We bought it. 
and it was a stock item with his company. I think it was made in Japan. Anyhow, um, for us to get a tuner in there that would tune also to an amband would cost us like 25 to 30 percent above what we wanted to to sell this rig for. So that got squashed. The other receiver, the GR98, covered the aviation band 108 to 136, and it was all AM. And this 88, one of our biggest sources of customers were volunteer firemen, because they didn't have an inexpensive monitor. This thing had provisions for one crystal controlled channel. So we showed them how, how to order crystal for it and how to tune it in. They would put a crystal there on their local fire frequency. That way, if they happened to get the tuning off, they didn't miss anything. So we sold it. This was in a catalog until 1978, I think was the last year that they pulled it out. The GR98 was pulled out in 76. So it had a pretty good run. It ran on nine volts. We used C-cells so it would last longer. And you could also buy an accessory AC supply that went right in the rig and you could power it with 110. Also had external antenna so you could put an outside antenna on it. And uh, like I said, for a small project it, uh, it went pretty well. Okay, Bob. This was my last project. It started about 1968. It's called the HW-17. It was a two-meter uh, transceiver <laughs> at uh, 10 watts out AM, and it uh, tuned a little, little beyond each side of the band. When this came out, um, FM repeaters were just starting, and the one that we heard all the time was in Chicago. It was called the CFMC, uh, Chicago FM Club. Mostly, probably 99% Motorola employees, because that's where Motorola was made. And their antenna was 900 feet up on top of a bike building. 146.760 was their channel. So we could hear it because that has an AM receiver, but you can do what they say, slope detecting. So if you tuned it just right, the FM come in loud and clear. Of course, you have squelch control, so you could sit there and monitor. Well, we thought, my lab partner and I said, great if we could uh, talk to them. So I come up with this little box down there in the middle of the page on the right side. It was a little box you could build up, put it on the back of the 17, and it was a crystal oscillator with a reactance modulator, you could talk FM. And slope detect, and it worked. So we, we built it up, prototype, put it on the rig, and only had a little ground plane up on the roof of the engineering building where we were. And we could just barely, with 10 watts, barely get into the repeater in Chicago. So one day, my lab tech, Rich, comes in with a pile of aluminum tubing so we spent the day building a five element wide space two meter beam, took it up on the roof and replaced the ground plane with it. Boy, and we were loud and clear to the Chicago Repeater. Mm. Whatever they're painting up there, and it's electrostatically charged so that when the paint went by it, it would adhere to the panel. And then they went through other phases, like if they silk screened it or put a second color on it. The last thing they put on was a clear coat. Whitey Westerhoven was in charge of the paint shop, and we used to do favors for each other. Uh, had a friend of mine that had a Collins line, but he bought an SB200 amp. He wanted the front panel to be the same color as a Collins. <laughs> so I went down to Whitey, and t we had a blank panel, and sure enough, it come back with the proper gray color, silk screen. Didn't say SB200 though. So, got it back to my buddy over there. He was happy for it. And Whitey would come up looking for parts to repair stuff, so we'd take care of Whitey. That's the HW202. I'm getting into a little, I left in 1970 to, 
to my little two-way radio business I started in 65 had gotten big. So I left Heath to do full time with that. Uh, in 73, they came out with this rig right here, HW202, the first, their first two meter FM rig, six channels, crystal controlled, and it says tone up there. That's actual tone burst. That's an audible. The first repeaters out used tone burst to activate the receivers. Uh, England still did for a long time at 1750 uh, KC. There is a 40 watt amp. Somebody was asking me about that. And here is the rig here. We can look at it when we get done, but this belongs to Dave, KR4U. He built it, used it. I imagine it would still work. <laughs> Not much can go wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the rigs that came out around this time were not synthesized. They were all crystal controlled. Uh, Regency came out with the BTH. And this came out in 1974 uh, in December. This was their first HF all solid state uh, 80 through 10 uh, transceiver with digital readout and it cost 700 bucks. Um, you could buy the remote VFO. The 230 was a conduction cooled amplifier. I've only seen one of them. Anyhow, we have this rig here. It's right here on the table. It was given to Heath by W4TA. This rig was built in Amman, Jordan. And there's the guy who owned it. That's King Hussein of Jordan. And W4TA was his consultant and his call was JY9BB. So I asked uh, Blackie before he became a silent kid, I said, well, how much work did the king do on the rig? And Blackie was, well, I let him solder a little bit. <laughs> well, you, anytime you see the rig dials with the king, there's the drake line. But he did use this rig for a while in 75. Blackie brought this rig clear back from the States when he was traveling between the States and Jordan. So he says, uh, you're a Heath Kit guy. I says, yeah. He says, why don't you take that back to the club? So we have the, the uh, that rig there, even though it's uh, probably a, a antique collector's item, but it still works. We've got the 104 in the back room. We've got this big round tube and it's got a full schematic in it that they used in the service department with all the notes and stuff so uh, he got us that and he sent it down so we've got a full schematic and what we also got there this is Dave Popluski Dave at one time was chief engineer uh, he was what they call the chief engineer of the the Browns the Brown equipment the 5400 and the 9000. He was there for that.